Uh, our second reading comes from Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. And this is actually in our lectionary for today, but you'll see in a little bit how it leads into our conversation. It is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. They, Jesus and the disciples, went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and he taught. Those there were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and cried with a loud voice came out of him. They were amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I read this passage uh, a couple weeks ago, looking at, uh, at our worship services for the next couple months, the phrase that really struck out to me in this passage was when the demons that, that Jesus cast out ask him, what have you to do with us? I'm not sure why they asked that question, but it seems as if they're sort of wondering, what, why are you dealing in this realm? Why don't you just do physical healings? Why don't you just concern about feeding people? Why are you dealing in this realm? And sometimes as I read that, I, I sort of think maybe we think the same thing with Jesus. That we think there's certain realms that Jesus' healing and care and love is for, but certain other ones we leave Jesus out completely. And one that I think we've especially left Jesus out of in our church is talking about Jesus and mental health. We lift up and worship physical health concerns. We lift up maybe spiritual things going on. But when it comes to mental health, we've been not just for Stonehouse, but our, our church universal has been silent for way too long. And in that silence, we've had different messages, some not so good messages come up, messages of judgment or shame. And maybe as well as people of faith, people who want to care and love, we're not always equipped how we can care for other people, and we're especially not always equipped for how we can care for ourselves. When we have things come up, when we have questions about mental health, when we have struggles with mental health, which I have to say every single community of faith I've ever been a part of has those questions, has those concerns, has those, has those uh, illnesses there and, and needs. And so I, I think this is a conversation that's long overdue. Uh, for today, I also knew that I'm not maybe the best for, for answering all those questions. And I was fortunate to have a friend in our community, uh, Reverend Rachel A. Bear, who's the associate pastor at Williamsburg Presbyterian Church, who has a real heart for this conversation of faith and mental health. Right now, she is doing her doctorate of ministry at Union uh, Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, and her focus on this is mental health. So I want to very much welcome Reverend Rachel Bear with us this day, and I want to start off our conversation today by asking her one question, and that is for Reverend Rachel, is what made you, Rachel, uh, choose mental health as your focus for your doctoral work? Why do you believe that this is such an important area for you and the church to face and learn more about? Thanks so much, Alex. I appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. It's so great to be here with you in worship today. Um, so a lot of it starts with my own story. Um, and my first journey with mental health was being diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder. Um, sometimes it's called winter blues, but for me, it was pretty specifically between um, right after Christmas, all the way up through maybe the beginning of May. Um, and it would feel like there was just this mental switch that would go off within me. And um, I have a vivid memory of sharing this with someone um, and saying, I've been, um, what do we call it? Um, I've been diagnosed with this. 
Um, and someone, and their response was, okay, well, we can't tell anyone about this. And I was so deeply struck in that moment and just thought, well, wouldn't this be the perfect time for community to come in? Wouldn't this just be the most wonderful opportunity to be inviting others into this space? Um, and so as I have grown and as actually my mental illnesses have progressed and such, I actually have bipolar two disorder, which is known as um, manic depressive disorder. Um, and so as I've grown through experiencing depression and anxiety up to this more recent diagnosis um, and realizing this is something I've likely been living with my whole life. Um, and yet I've learned to be able to manage it in some day-to-day -day works. Um, but I have to give a shout out to my therapist um, who I work so diligently with um, to find the right medications and to find the right lifestyle. Um, and so it was because of that very first conversation with someone and as I've continued to progress and develop that it has been so important to me to bring community alongside me. Um, I think the worst thing that we can do and what mental health usually tells us to do, especially with mental illnesses, is you need to isolate yourself. I think the church can maybe have one of two responses. You're going to have one end that's maybe going to say you just need to pray about it. And so that is shutting someone out and telling them this is their issue that they need to deal with It's between them and God. Um, the other side might say, this is between you and your therapist. This is between you and getting those medications and everything else. So we have these two sides that are sending this message of isolation. So I ask, where's the community? And here's where I think the church can come in is in this middle space here in this space that says prayer is necessary, faith is necessary in this dialogue and in this conversation. But also we recognize that this isn't just going to be solved by prayer, that there actually need to be professionals involved within this. Um, and so how do we bring our faith and our mental health together in ways that include the community and don't say isolate yourself? And so I started practicing this with my friends and my family um, and starting by telling them uh, just as Alex was saying in his children's message of telling uh, children telling your parents um, what makes you feel like you are restful um, and inviting them into that similarly as someone who has um, a mental illness I need to inform my people okay I'm having a really bad day I need help right now and over the years, I've learned, and it has taken years to learn, what it is that helps me the most. Um, so for me, it's I need to go outside, I need to be eating something healthy, and I need to do something creative. And so whenever I'm lost in my mental illness, um, I will go to those people and say, I'm spiraling, what do I do? And they know immediately to go through that checklist Rachel had gone for a walk outside today. You have to get outside. Have you done something creative? Go cook something healthy for yourself right now. Um, so those are just some of the ways that work for me. Um, but that was a key way to invite community into my journey and to not isolate myself in this. I hope that answered your first question well, Alex. <laughs> That was excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. That was uh, for especially for being so so open and sharing so much about your own story, and then what you found really helpful in that need for community. That's uh, I think if if anything, the church should be able to be offer. It should be community. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a really great message and challenge for us. Uh, you had a, you had a follow up question for me, I believe. I do. So I really want to know, why do you think that this is such a necessary conversation to be having right now in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I there's a number of reasons I think this is such an important question. One is, as I mentioned earlier, we've just been way too silent and have ignored it for way too long. 
Uh, and actually, I, I was meaning to be to have this be a part of a sermon series last June when we were going to talk about topics that we often don't face openly as we should within the church. And this was going to be one. And then I realized, oh, I'm, I may not be the best one for leading that conversation or having all the answers. Uh, and then as uh, both with the, the, the text for today really remind me, but also what we're seeing especially right now with COVID-19, that, um, that we are really, uh, along with the, the health crisis of COVID-19 and the, the illness crisis of that, we know that there is a serious mental health crisis going on too. Um, I know there was one school district, I believe it was Las Vegas, that just went back to school because they have seen a very alarming spike in, in mental health for their youth and even including for, for suicides. Um, and so this is something that's that's been going on and, and needing to be faced for a long time, but especially right now is maybe even more so. I know as well um, that as a pastor, I've I've had um, I've had both here and in previous settings lots of conversations with with members and people and, and friends and community members who are looking for some answers or for looking for some some starting points and. I, I might have a couple places, but really I know I know part of it was just me wanting to get some more tools for myself and be able to help and to to hear some of those things. You you had mentioned uh, that the church I think often responds in a, in a a number of ways when mental health is the topic, and I've sort of seen this the same way. I think the first way we we often respond to silence is we just ignore it. Uh, we lift up prayer requests for, for physical illness here, but not very often for mental things going on. Um, and uh, part of it, and not meaning that people need to share that when they're not, especially with maybe a, a huge community, we don't want that to be a pressure, um, but just realizing like, do they think that's not something we care about? Are they like the voices in this uh, reading, like the demons that say, what have you to do with us? Don't, don't worry about this area. Um, I think the answer Jesus says is, is no, I've come for your whole healing and that we should be lifting all those things up to Jesus. And I, I want, I hope people at least feel comfortable or safe coming to me about those. I may not have perfect answers, but I care very much about that. And if you have struggles, if you have questions, if there's just things going on, please, I would love uh, to, to be in conversation with you and to at least journey with you in that. Um, the second way I've seen people though respond is some of that judgment or shame um, is sometimes thinking, well, if you're struggling with mental health, um, especially the ways it can maybe show itself, whether it's, it's depression or anxiety or addiction, um, sometimes it, it becomes, well, you just like, you need to figure yourself out. You need to get things right. And, um, and that really like, and really pushing people away from faith and away from God's grace and love. And that's not helpful. And then the third way I see is probably actually the most common way. And I think the way most of our people at, at Stonehouse and probably Williamsburg Presbyterian Church would respond to is that when, when someone shares with us a struggle of something with mental health, what we want to do is fix it right away. And we want to say, well, if you have this issue, uh, you just need to be around people more, or you need to exercise, or you need to change your way of thinking. And some of those things might be helpful, but we often minimize how hard some of those things are, especially when you're going through um, some some areas with mental health. The, the, just like the saying, just get, you just need to think more positive. Well, sometimes that's really hard to do. Uh, you just need to get out and, and be around people. Sometimes there are days you wake up and that can be uh, the most daunting task ever. Um, and sometimes just a saying those words minimizes, it makes people, I think, instead of helping them or giving them answers, even that's what we really want to do with these come out of real places of compassion. What they do is make people feel even more guilty mm -hmm. themselves. So why am I not fixing it or solving it right away? And instead, I think what we need is that more long-term community, that mental health is a, a very long-term thing. And so part of it, I really think uh, as, you, as you've been sharing and talking, part of it is we, our first response needs to be simply listening and simply there and saying, I'm going to journey with you in this. Uh, maybe at some point we'll have some, some helpful some suggestions, but I think the first thing when people reach out that they need to hear is 
I'm with you. You're not alone. And I'm going to be with you in this journey. Um, it, may, it means that you're heard. It means it's really is taken seriously. And it's where I think we as a community of faith can show the most love. But that's not part of our, our, regular, our regular nature is to try to fix things. And we want to fix it. And I think the biggest thing for us is to say, instead, let's, let me take a, a, a step back. Let me pause when someone shares this and just say, I'm here with you. So thank you for that question, Rachel. Uh, I, I think this is a pressing thing for all of us uh, as people of faith, whether we are going through it or a friend or family, or we just have questions. This is something we should be talking about right now. Um, as you have a, a new friend uh, behind you in your room with you right now, thank Rachel, uh, <laughs> I'm, I have another question for you. Right. And that is um, for us as people of faith, what, uh, where, where can we start with caring for mental health? What's one thing we as a community can, can do better? Um, I'm sure there's lots of things we can do better, but what's, what's maybe the one starting point that you might have for us this day as we, we want to ask, how can we care for ourselves and for others more? What, what's one thing we can do to start? Absolutely. Um, one area I would absolutely suggest is education. Um, there is a very, there's a fantastic, it's the, it'll be a super short read. It's called Mind Your Head. It is by Juno Dawson and by Dr. Olivia Hewitt. Um, this book, Juno Dawson is a young adult author. And so it's very playful at times, but it is the most um, easily read, digestible sort of intro to um, understanding mental health. Um, and from that book, one of the greatest things that I've learned is whenever we start talking about, especially things like anxiety and depression, we need to be able to distinguish between what is a, what is capital D depression and lowercase d depression. Similarly with capital A anxiety and lowercase a anxiety. Everyone, it's part of the human condition to experience anxiety and depression, little a, little d. But there are some people who whenever you talk about depression, it is capital D, a depressive disorder, or it's a capital A, a generalized anxiety disorder. So one thing I would say is, how can you change your language? If you're talking about feeling anxious, little a anxious, um, can you use different synonyms for that? I feel very stressed out right now. I feel very nervous right now. I have butterflies in my stomach. Um, talking about depression, I feel really blue right now. I'm in a funk. I can't quite get out of it. Um, changing those words is going to be an incredible part of education um, for ourselves and for other people. Uh, Alex, what you said just nailed it on the head as well, is don't use fix-it language. Um, this is someone's new normal that they're experiencing and that they are going through. And so part of the community's job is to help them discern what does my new normal look like? And how does this new normal inform my faith? So for me, it, whenever I first started going through this um, journey with my mental health, I suddenly found that I understood Paul's words of what it meant to pray without ceasing. Because all of a sudden, I was constantly praying, help me, help me, help me. I need you, I need you, I need you. And those are my breath prayers over and over and over again. This was not something I understood whenever I was in perfect health or thought I had perfect health. Um, I don't think any of us have perfect health. Um, but whenever it wasn't until engaging with this mental illness and embracing it and accepting it as part of my new normal, um, that I was able to experience God in a very different way. And that it became really important for me to share that with others as well, with other people of faith, so that they could also learn as well from me and this unique um, mindset that I now have and how I understand myself and how my mind works and everything. I think those are kind of the top ones that I can give you here. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Rachel, for that. Um, 
And especially that book, uh, I'll, I'll maybe invite you to share that with me or send yeah, me the, the link to that. The, uh, yeah, I'll that here. Yeah, because that would be wonderful. I, I do have a follow-up uh, question with that is, um, is uh, for those who are uh, seeking uh, help themselves, mm -hmm. um, are there places for either counseling or therapy that in absolutely. the area that you would recommend? And if you could say a little bit about the difference between the two. As yeah, well. absolutely. Um, so one place is the Peninsula Pastoral Counseling Center. Um, important distinction between a counselor and a therapist. A counselor has a master's degree. A therapist is going to have a doctorate. So a counselor is going to be really, really great at helping you to game plan, to say, okay, so what do we need to start doing? What are the best next steps for you? Um, I've been to the Peninsula Pastoral Counseling Center. Um, it also was really great for bringing my faith into the conversation as well. Um, with that particular center, there are various pastors in our area who are on the board of directors. Um, for Peninsula Pastoral Counseling Center. It's based in Newport News, but they do have some counselors who come up to Williamsburg. Um, and I know that pre-pandemic, they were coming to Williamsburg United Methodist Church. Um, the second one that I would recommend, if you're looking more for a therapist, and a therapist is going to ask you that very tricky and hard question of why. So why are you feeling this way? So, and so they are going to really invite you to become acquainted with your mental illness, um, as well as work with you. Um, so the difference then between a therapist and a psychiatrist is therapist has a doctorate, psychiatrist is going to have um, a doctor, doctoral degree as in uh, not a PhD or uh, educational, uh, doctor of education, they're going to be medical professional. Um, so I uh, personally go to Family Living Institute. Um, it's a wonderful place here in Williamsburg, right off of Jamestown Road. They have an in-house nurse practitioner who therapists can work with to help you figure out your medications directly, which has been so hugely important for me, is that whereas my general uh, practitioner would have to refer me out to a specialist, I'm already seeing a specialist right then and there. And the specialist is in conversation with my therapist. My therapist is in conversation with the specialist. So that just closes the communication gap between the two of them. Um, so those are two that I would probably most highly recommend is they're what I have the most experience with and have had just wonderful experiences with both places. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Rachel. Um, and I, I did want to share that uh, this is not the end of, of Rachel's conversation of faith and mental health. Um, not only is she working on this for her doctorate, but that she will be, I believe, leading uh, sermons throughout the spring and, and summer on faith and mental health at Williamsburg Presbyterian Church. So if you're interested, please look out for those. Um, I, I will not be offended at all if you take a Sunday to worship there. Uh, I will be actually delighted uh, to know that. Um, and I'm so, so grateful for your time, for your great wisdom, for your really helpful uh, words and, and suggestions and some really great starting points. Um, I found this very, very wonderful. And, and I, I believe that Jesus cares about our whole person, our whole selves, mm -hmm. walks with us in everything we do, and that we as a church should be doing the same. So this was such a great, a great starting point for that. So thank you so much. Uh, would you mind uh, closing us in a word of prayer, uh, Not at all. Rachel? Let, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are grateful that you created us to be beings of wholeness. And that you delight whenever we rest in you, whenever our full selves rest in you, that we entrust you with our mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Oh, Lord, this is what you desire of us whenever we come before you, oh, Lord. And so, God, I pray that you would be with all those who are struggling and maybe don't know where they're going with their mental health, oh, Lord. And I pray for the church community to come alongside them. For people to realize that they are not alone, that not only do they have the community, but they have you walking alongside them, oh Lord, that they have your voice and your concern um, 
completely wrapped around them, there to give them as much comfort and as much guidance as possible. Oh, Lord, be with us as we discern what it is our steps that we need to take, the ways in which we need to be educated and the ways in which we are called to help others and the ways in which we are called to destigmatize these conversations surrounding mental health in the church. In your loving and gracious name, O oh Lord, amen.